I want to find the uh, folks up here, the only folks providing us with brunch. Uh, my next guest is here. And as I said earlier, uh, there's a poem in her column today. She's a columnist in the Express. And I like the one that she quoted today because uh, she did a number of them, mind you. But is crab climbing crab back in a quarrel and going round and round in the same barrel? A shark with sure jacks, sharks with well-pressed fins, ripping wee small fries off with razor grins. Nothing in change but color and attire. So back me up. All brigade of attire. Yes. <laughs> I like that. I like I like that. Her name, of course, is Sunati Maharaj. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning and Georgia. you are a from a wonderful background for what we're talking about uh, this morning. Among other things, going to be the role of media um, in in coverage and the way in which we we go about our business as media. You, of course, the managing director of the Lloyd Best Institute of the West Indies, editor of the. Trinidad and Tobago Review, you're also a media consultant, journalism, uh, your lecture, uh, uh, also you more importantly, or equally importantly, sorry, is a former editor-in-chief of the Trinidad Express, news director at TV6, and group executive and editorial and content development at One Caribbean Media. You are in a unique position. Don't ask me to get her card printed. Uh, you are in a unique position to comment on what we what, what we want to do this morning. Are you satisfied with the coverage of the elections in the media, the presentation of stories or utterances of politicians without fact, correction, and analysis? Of course not. Couldn't possibly be satisfied. Um, the media is in as much trouble as every other institution. Mm -hmm. We have to do a serious bit of introspection. Um, we're counting the cost in the quality of public discourse, which is fed by information that comes from the media. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have is public talk. The media is connected to it without filter and it's broadcast to the largest possible mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Um That is what social media is, except social media does not matter. Mm -hmm. well, social media, se people select their communities. Um, but what media is doing as an institution in Trinidad is demonstrating that we do not need a media. If you just need broadcasting capability, mm -hmm. why are we in there? Now, in practical terms, you see it functioning, where you have, you've had political meetings, and radio stations and TV stations would just simply broadcast live. You do not get a producer. Mm -hmm. You do not have a delay mechanism so simply, people are hiring your technology to broadcast whatever they want to see. And the notion that the media plays a role as a gatekeeper by verifying the information that is reaching its audience, that uh, ensuring it doesn't break any law, and so on, those are nullified. Mm -hmm. So then why do you need? The question will come. Why doesn't everyone simply get their technology and broadcast on their own? What's, mm -hmm. the, what's the point? There being such a migration of eyeballs, as they call it, uh, buttresses your point. It, 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 it is actually saying that those who now sit as the gatekeepers, which are the editors and the reporters of the traditional um, um, news reporting form, are contributing to their own demise. That's right, and I, do, I think it's such a short-sighted <coughs> view because the short-sightedness comes from the anxiety to earn money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you're, you're essentially renting out your station, you're abdicating whatever responsibilities that you agree to under the telecommunications authorities, you know, license and so on. Um, and you are eradicating the need for journalists. All you are as a media house now is technology. Mm -hmm. This decision comes from the from the top down. I wanted to ask you the role of the reporter, but I think it is clearly more important, more important uh, to ask the role of the editors in this. Or are they just carrying on the dictate of the board? And as such? You look at yesterday's rallies. Yes. In any country in the world, that is the high point of the political reporter's year. Yes, yes. They are the ones, they assemble, if you're on a TV station, a radio station, you assemble all your outside broadcast capabilities, you go, and you're not prepared to report to the country yes. about this rally. And you're interpreting, you're correcting, you're clarifying, you're analyzing, and, and so on. That 
political reporters were home watching TV. Yeah, because essentially folks went out yesterday, paid for their broadcast, said what they had to say without right. check, which is not dissimilar to what happened with the presentation of manifestos. That's right. So you have now the political parties, all high, they have hired their propaganda, you know, their people, their, their, um, their PR people, they dress up and look like reporters and mm. they're commentating and they're, they're, you know, they're also um, interviewing themselves mm -hmm. and each other and so on. And it, is so, it has become such a norm in the past five years that people have actually forgotten that when media houses were poor and the media wasn't making that much money, they still had the responsibility to go mm -hmm. there and perform the function of the media at these rallies. Mm -hmm. Now media houses are saying, if you don't, if you don't buy my airtime and pay for the outside broadcast, we're not covering. We call it, um, in the days of record playing business, it was called payola. That's right. Um, who you know was called plugola. This here is just straight prostitution. And the, 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 I mean, you this must is see that in that mad chase for dollars that they're making mm -hmm. this thing, they are ultimately contributing to the demise. demise. That's right. Mm -hmm. So editors now are, in fact, I remember even in the, in the radio context, the program department would always be at war with the sales department mm -hmm. because the program department is saying content, the sales is saying sell. But in this case, uh, in the media, print media we're talking about, but all media, but you're saying that the editors in the print arena, I guess in all of them, are now going at the behest of the, the, the direction of the well, sales department. Uh, well, it's different for the print because they, no, nobody's buying um, buying all the newspaper in the way they're buying the radio and That's right. time, mm -hmm. you know, so the reporters, the print reporters are doing that, coming back with their stories and so on, but it is the ethos that is taking hold of the media, mm -hmm. which is that editors are thinking about income, editors are thinking about, you know, cost cutting and so on. Your job is simply the editor. Everything else, that is the advertising right. department and the management and so on, with those things. Mm -hmm. That tension that is so necessary between the media as institution and media as industry that resides in media houses, that is what is disappearing. Is it well laid, the fear of social media that now causes many of the traditional media to go to the avenue of brevity, sacrificing context um, in, in, in doing so? Well, it's such a preliminary question in that it is because of what the media is doing, because the gatekeepers have disappeared, mm -hmm. then the social, on social media, people are not getting anything special from the media. In fact, very often they're getting more analysis, more, faster information and so on on social media. Mm. So if you simply compare the traditional and, um, and, and new media, where is the advantage of buying that one? You know, I can go on and, I, and people are reading people who are just putting their blogs and so on and they find it's of better quality. So the idea of a profession that has uh, something, offers something that the amateur does not, that is what is being eroded. So if, for example, people were satisfied with, with doctors who didn't know any, with, with our doctors, mm. if everybody's going to uh, somebody who claims that it can cure you, then the demand and value of doctors would fall, right? Because, but the reason you're going to your, you know, your specialist doctor and so on is because you know there's a capability there that you may, you will not find in the man around the corner who mm -hmm. just says he's been you know reading up, right? That's what is happening with the media. If journalists do, if the media does not demonstrate it has capabilities that cannot be found on social media, among bloggers and so on, that this is a profession, mm -hmm. then why bother? The voice you hear is that of Sunuti Maharaj. He's the managing director of the Lloyd Best Institute of the West Indies in the capacity she has occupied just about everyone in our business. Um, the editorial position of it is why we are walking in this area. There is um, the general feeling, and, 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 and folks have to pay attention to it, that if you think social media is something you must emulate, you may as well just go into that business. Because at some point, as you said, there must be something here you say the New York Times, you say the New York, the Washington Post, folks know you're talking about something where verification happens all the time. You know, this is the, the, the benchmark, this is the standard, this is the gold standard. I am not seeing a gold standard here, and particularly because I don't know if reporters are being told that they are more than press release repeaters. If they are in fact being told, you have to go and look at the information, the 
spectrum of reporters we are seeing now is what I'm asking about. Are you satisfied with the with, with what is set up to train them how to go about this? Or are they in fact being trained properly but quickly have to abandon it to conform to the dictates of what their editor and or employer may think? Well, I think even the reporters are not satisfied with the level of training that they themselves are getting. Mm. <clears throat> Many reporters are asking for a lot more and are not getting it. Um, and the media houses are inclined to say that it's not worth investing in people because they very quickly migrate. Mm. Why am I putting so much money and training in you and as soon as you get a job offering you a lot more money, <clears throat> which is you know either in PR or some communication specialist thing or in the government, that you go. Mm -hmm. So you're getting that corrosive impact of a business decision that says it's not important and it's not good business to invest in journalism. Why should I give the shoe to the cobbler um, when um, mm -hmm. I, I guess I'll dis disregard it or it will lead me, is, mm -hmm. is that the thinking? But that, that is, is crazy because the integrity of the shoe is what I must pay attention to regardless of how long I wear it for. That's it? right. <clears throat> and the other thing is that you can't solve the problem of underpaying professionals. Okay? You want, you want to have journalists that are career journalists, you have to pay them well. Um, the notion that a journalist is young and eager beaver and will run all over the place and so on, that's, that can carry you so far. Mm. By the time youthful enthusiasm runs out, because you're all going to journalism and you know it's the most fantastic place, it, what better place to be than in the place where everything happens? Mm. But then as people get older, a lot of things happen. They want to move from just the beat. They want the horizons of their career to open up to them. They want to be doing documentaries. They want to be doing books. They want to be doing special reports. They want, they want that ceiling, that professional ceiling to rise, and they want the income levels to rise because they move from being young teenager, teenagers and so on, and they start to acquire families, and they have the mortgage like everybody else. And then when their partner asks, you know, why are you staying in that job and somebody else is offering, they have to have a good answer. Mm -hmm. Not they were, they can't say, well, I really love it, so yeah, I love it, but you know, we don't have this and we don't have that. So there needs to be an investment in a profession. But I am beginning to wonder if it's not too late because the technology has caught up mm -hmm. with the industry. Oh, it's left the industry behind, That's maybe. That's right. And so I don't even know if you, if you in reinvented the media right now, you put the best people, the best technology, whether it's not too late. That in fact the horse is bolting, and, and maybe what we need to do now is, as some people are doing, you build a profession on social media. So that even on social media, people know that I'm reading this one and that one, but if I want the gold standard, I can mm. go to this site. Mm. And what you need now is a revenue model, a business model. Many folks have attempted and spoken about the, 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 the importance of being with the technology, being with the new disseminator of information, which is the social media, but then you don't have a money model. I mean, the, the, you, you can get all the eyeballs, but you cannot define this demographic is here, or this uh, convince uh, an advertiser, here's why you should be here, because you know, you've got a lot, of, a lot of IPs hitting you, but I don't know exactly um, who is in fact reading. Yeah. Well, we do have, um, we have people who are trying here, Lasana Leibold's 86 inch wire. Um, he has found, he runs his website and he, um, what you know is that this model is low cost. Mm -hmm. So you can actually cover your costs and make mm -hmm. a little profit with much, uh, with much less income. So I think Lasana is making it happen. Um, and, and the challenge for him is how to grow that model. But he has been in it for a few years and it brings him enough for him to pay himself and pay a couple of people who work, who work with him. Saturation in the media is something that uh, we all uh, experience every election time, but I have not seen it as much as I have this year. Is it because I've been out of the loop? Or is the saturation something that's working against informing the general populace in your mind? Yeah, I think that, um, but if you're talking saturation and what in terms of... Yeah, advertising. Yeah, yeah, yes. mm. uh, I don't think people take it on, you know. I think that people... It's so much money is going into this, and I, I wonder if they evaluate mm -hmm. the impact. Mm -hmm. um, people, if people are inclined to take on what they already support. In other words, why bother? Why bother to target those who already support you and the ones they don't support? They flip it. Mm -hmm. You know, they ignore it. They turn off the TV. They get vexed. They, you know, um. So, 
this is an idea, I think it's a it's an outdated idea for Trinidad, and it goes back to the power of 1981. When I think we really saw political advertising, it came in with the organization of national reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And if I were to credit one person <coughs> as being the first mm -hmm political advert, um, media, um, ad, well, advertiser, the person designing messages and so on, I would say it was Lloyd Carter, mm -hmm. Lloyd Carter mm -hmm. and PR counselors. Um, we had not seen that alliance between uh, business, politics, and advertising in the mix, as we saw in 1981. The PNM took a long time to cotton on to this idea of advertising, um, and they have always been behind until this year. Um, after the PNM, uh, after the ONR, then we saw it uh, steadily grow with the NAR. The NAR was, you know, it, they, it, they had amassed all these um, business um, financiers and so on, and people were paying for these things. Uh, and, and we've seen that grow over time. Um, but I am thinking that other forces are at play now. It, it had a powerful impact in the early years, mm -hmm. but other forces. I think the area needs to be studied for us to make a to, to, to determine. And I'm, I'm waiting to see the outcome of this election because there has been such a huge investment. Yes, I yes. mean, the, the government has this thing called ICON, Integrated Whatever Communication. Every The, the whole, the billboard, social media, print, and broadcast. Mm -hmm. um, they're boasting that they captured, they are all platforms. It's the first time in the world, which I, you know, I don't know that that is really so, but that's the boast. But that is where you get into overkill. And, mm -hmm. and the, the important questions inside of that is well, how much of it is public money? We, <laughs> it's a whole different uh, conversation, uh, one that's worthy of a conversation, but in the limited time we have, I'm, I'm, st I'm, I'm staying in my lane. Is that the wrong thing to say? Anyway, <laughs> uh, Sunati Maharaj is our guest this morning, uh, columnist, editor, uh, your experience, you are a political analyst, you're looking at what we have before us. Give me, if you will, handicap tomorrow's voter turnout and uh, results, if you, if, if you uh, care to. I, I, I will stay away from calling the election. Um, I will talk about the factors. Please. I think that um, every election is determined by momentum and the last weekend. Mm -hmm. Who has the momentum? Where is the energy? Because it is that energy that flows on into the polling booth. Um, and people try to determine, the strategists try to determine how to play the wave. Mm -hmm. right? I think this weekend, I feel the energy is with the PNM. Um, that having been said, everybody knows that what counts in the end is the votes. In the booth. You do it sometimes, the energy silences the vote. So you have energy, but you have the quietness and people are going to vote. Mm -hmm. I think it's hard. Um, I'm looking at HHB, um, the poll HHB. I have found Louis Virtual to be quite uh, uh, informed and quite knowledgeable about this the, the social configuration. And what is he calling for? He's calling 22 seats for the PNM and 19 right. for the parliament. And he has focused his efforts on the marginals. Mm -hmm. and, um, you yeah, I mean, Trinidad's election, you could almost say, don't worry to have an election in this constituency, and that on both sides, we know who's going to win on those. Um, that, some of that is changing, but the, if, the, the, if the PNM catches the momentum, and I, I find the energy is there, marginals can go, and they mm. can almost go as one, because it's the same element that defines all the marginals, and that is, where are the constituencies that the base vote is not so dominant that that, what I would call the center, the one, the one that is not, not aligned to one ethnic base or another, mm -hmm. is willing to vote one way or the other. So that is the most important um, elim, um, group in the electorate because they are the ones who have been changing governments. They have voted um, to put the PNM in and put them out. They voted to put the UNC in one configuration or another, in or out. Mm -hmm. The great challenge for the UNC has been to, over a period of five years, to transform itself into a party that has um, embraced the COP constituency, what used to be the ONR constituency, that's mm -hmm. the middle constituency. Has it done so? I don't think so.
there's a fracture, a racial uh, fracture that we're going on, and we know that folks are voting in their respective communities. Yes, right but not all, you know. In fact, the, the single largest constituency is the constituency that's not voting for race. Mm -hmm. That is why governments have changed. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Governments are changing because there's a big enough group of people who will vote for one party or the other. If that wasn't big, then it wouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's an accepted situation then that we are always going to stay with that constituency that will make the difference, do you think, Jack? Uh, Jack, one is a factor in this, in, in, in this election. Well, um, that constituency is the constituency that is the one that's growing. The ethnic base is shrinking. Mm -hmm. I don't goodness. think the ethnic base is, on each side is more than 15%. I am happy to hear that. I am encouraged to hear that because that fracture is one of the things I was going to ask you and you just answered it. Um, I'm very worried about you have to stay in Trinidad and Tobago. We have to find ways not to fall victims of people who use this uh, to stay in power from both sides. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm happy to see that. All right, so you're not, you're, not, you're not going to fall into the trap of tomorrow, but as you said, the indicators say that the momentum is here, which does not mean votes. We are going to have a very sobering uh, morning, Tuesday morning. Mm, yeah. Or Monday night. Yes, but we have so much history with change of late. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but we didn't change for 30 years, and then we've just been changing and changing. So we have um, that fear of change, I, I think. Yes, people work it up before the election because they're trying to, to, to corral you into the vote. Mm -hmm. But the reality comes on, mon on Tuesday morning, and we're okay. You subscribe to polls, by the way. You 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 see validity in polls. Yeah, I think I think mm -hmm. so. But the, but but the um, the science mm -hmm. of polling in particular society is what we still need to be working on. It is going to be a very very difficult situation for Trinidad and Tobago when we look at the finances of the country, the oh, movement yeah. of the world. So the winner may be asking him, <laughs> maybe asking some questions. Um, how do I deal with this? You see a lot of uh, problems coming. Absolutely, because. We, go, we know that we are in a tough situation, mm -hmm. far tougher. We know that the, the government has been letting the, the rope go on the economy in the interest of the, um, the winning the election. Um, and if the figures we saw in the economic bulletin put out by the central bank yes. recently, mm -hmm. it's, much, it's going to be much, <coughs> that was up to April. Up to April, yes. And we know that the media report it got is worse. going to be mm -hmm. much worse. Mm -hmm. um, and so... That is going to be the challenge because the politics now is going to be challenged by how do you get persuade the country and all the different interests that are expecting all kinds of things mm -hmm. to settle for less. And that's regardless of who gets it. So you're going to need a serious political capability to persuade people to the national interest above self-interest. Yes. Yes, that's going to be the challenge for all of us. You, going to be you, yes, you, you can't buy silence. You don't have the money. Yes, that is going to be something we're looking at. I'm going to invite you back at some point. Uh, any final thoughts for reporters, particularly uh, young reporters trying to get into this? As you said, maybe the horse is out in closing the barn door. Is, 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 we're just too late for doing that. But reporters who look at your wealth of, of, of experience and knowledge in, 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 in this business called journalism, what's the best advice you can give them amidst all that we have said? That, that, that money is the determinant in a lot of offices. But they, these folks are coming in hungry. In the few years, as you said, they have running with all this buck energy. Uh, what advice would you give them? There's, only, there's always only one piece of advice for journalists. In your head, you have to have answered the questions, who am I voting for? I'm voting for the national interest. When that happens, tomorrow's job is, your job is to go out there and scrutinize everything, be alert, and if there's anything that you need to have investigated and to question and to challenge, mm -hmm. do it. Do not fall under the spell of one party spokesman or another. You're serving the interests of the people to ensure that the election goes fairly, mm -hmm. professionally, and if there are questions to be answered, they have to be answered right away. Don't wait until the next day to say, well, I said this or that or the other. The managing director of the Lloyd Best Institute of the West Indies, a um, lady that I've admired for a long time and I've spoken to a number of times in New York. In New York, you left me with one line that I remember many of my uh, users, uh, listeners rather, would send me email on. It's called Government by Extempo. They never forgot that line. <laughs> Sunity Maharaj, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you.